Hello, this is Professor Scott Applegate. Welcome to PSCS 6248, Introduction to Cyber Conflict, Unit 1, Lesson 1, Introduction, Terminology, and Methods. During this presentation, we will explore the overarching concept of cyber conflict, attempt to define a common lexicon for this course, and discuss the methods we will employ as we explore this domain. Finally, we will briefly look at our first case study, Flambe. Introduction. What is cyber conflict? Cyber conflict is an umbrella term we use to describe the many adversarial interactions we see between nation states and between states and non-state actors in cyberspace. We use this term because many of the other terms used in the press or by politicians, such as cyber war, simply do not accurately describe the activity we are seeing in this domain. How can we differentiate between the many conflict activities that are occurring in cyberspace? Many of these activities, such as cyber espionage, cyber crime, or cyber warfare, use the same tools, technologies, and methods to accomplish their goals, and often the only difference is the motive of the attacker. Given how exaggerated reporting often is in complex activities, how can we accurately determine what the real threat is versus hyperbole? You will find that is one of the main themes of this course, and hopefully by the end of this course, you will be skilled at cutting through the hype. Assessing the problem. It is extremely difficult to rationally address the emerging threats in cyber conflict because these threats are often wildly exaggerated by the press, media, politicians, and even the military. Some of the reasons for this are obvious, some less so. The general public does not understand what are often highly technical issues and rely on the popular media to frame the problem. Unfortunately, the media is not much better. Reasons for these problems include power politics, fear-based threat construction, and hyperbolic rhetoric. Oftentimes, any time an attack happens, it is described as the most dangerous attack or the most dangerous threat to the country at this time, when often that may not be the case. States are trying to build deterrence frameworks in order to deter hostile acts in cyberspace. They are making displays of force, and these displays of force can often lead to threat escalation. During this course, we will attempt to determine the real state of affairs in cyber conflict. We will look at concepts like restraint and rational actors. We will attempt to use empirical evidence to define what is actually happening and what the effects of what is happening have on our state and other states across the world. And we will look at emerging norms in cyberspace. Cutting through the hype. The biggest problem in the cyber conflict domain today is actually one of perception. The popular media often wildly exaggerates the threat and impact of events that occur in cyberspace. This is not to say that there is not a serious threat, only to say that it is not nearly as dangerous as the press would have you believe it. It is worth keeping in mind that the news has now become a profit center for most networks, and each news service is jockeying for position in the 24-hour news cycle. As a result, they often use hyperbolic language to attempt to sell their stories. Fear sells stories. Additionally, in their rush to beat other news sources to the punch, they are often inaccurate in their reporting. Another serious problem in this domain is the constant use of inaccurate language. Terms like attack and war are used to describe what is often minor criminal activity. We will attempt to remedy this problem in the coming slides by defining a common lexicon for this course. Another source of hype in this domain is the fact that cyber conflict has become big business. Politicians exaggerate the threat in order to benefit their political districts. Commercialization and militarization of this domain has led to a new wave of defense contractors selling services and cyber weapons to the military and abroad. The more pressing the threat, the more potential profit there is for these new industries. New military units have stood up. These units bring with them new jobs and new commercial opportunities. It is important whenever you hear someone speaking on cyber conflict, or any topic for that matter, to determine what that speaker's perspective is and why they are framing the problem as they are. Everyone, including your instructor, has personal biases that affect how they view a problem. 
By identifying this early, you can often identify potential sources of hype, rhetoric, and bias. Terminology. Providing accurate definitions is problematic in this domain. There is no international policy and no definitive authority. There are multiple definitions for many terms that we use across this domain. We will present a series of definitions of the most commonly used terms in this domain in order to contrast differences and come to an agreed upon lexicon for this course. Our goal is to be precise in our use of terminology. We don't want to describe malicious activity as an attack. We don't want to describe espionage as an attack. When a spy steals something out of a building, we don't call that an attack, but for some reason when he uses a computer to do so, the press does call it an attack. We want to dispense with that. Cyber. The prefix cyber simply means computer or digital interactions. Adding it to a word simply means that you are implying that that has something to do with computers or the internet. Adding this prefix often overcomplicates relatively simple problems. Many times in my day job, as I'm dealing with complex issues involving cyberspace and cyberspace operations, what I tell people is to remove the term cyber and address the problem the same way. That often simplifies it and makes the answer obvious. We need to keep that in mind as we're working through this domain. Cyberspace. One of the earliest definitions of this term comes from the science fiction book Neuromancer, written by William Gibson in 1984. Mr. Gibson describes cyberspace as a consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions of legitimate operators in every nation by children being taught mathematical concepts. A graphic representation of data abstracted from the banks of every computer in the human system. Unthinkable complexity. Lines of light ranged in the non-space of the mind, clusters and constellations of data. While this is an interesting historical definition and is the source of the modern term, it is not entirely accurate for what we have today. Mr. Gibson, in his book, envisioned human beings connected to cyberspace by way of a human brain interface. Mr. Gibson commented on the term in an interview in the year 2000, noting, it seemed like an effective buzzword. It seemed evocative and essentially meaningless. It was suggestive of something, but had no real semantic meaning. Unfortunately, Mr. Gibson's comments are not entirely inaccurate today. A more modern definition of cyberspace from the authors of one of our textbooks is the networked system of microprocessors, mainframes, and basic computers that interact in digital space. This domain has physical elements because these systems occupy physical locations. This is an important concept to keep in mind. While cyberspace is often called borderless, it is important to realize that virtually every piece of computer hardware physically resides in some state's sovereign territory. Villariano and Manes further note a physical socio-technological environment a separate domain, but one that interacts and blends with other domains or layers. This domain is clearly not isolated and cuts across spectrums. Another important point, the cyberspace domain interacts with and cuts across all of the physical domains. A friend of mine, Dr. Samuel Lyles, has defined cyberspace as the terrain of technology-mediated communications. This seems simplistic, but also fairly accurate. Since this course is on conflict, we will look at how the military has defined cyberspace. The Department of Defense has defined cyberspace as a global domain within the information environment consisting of the interdependent networks of information technology infrastructures and resident data, including the internet, telecommunications networks, computer systems, and embedded processors and controllers. One thing missing from this definition is the user. Every interaction in cyberspace starts with a human being. People or the wetware as they are sometimes known, are often the essential vulnerability in malicious cyber activity. They can become both the means and the goal of a cyber intrusion. So it's important to keep the user or the human being in mind when you're thinking of the overall concept of cyberspace. The Department of Defense has also declared cyberspace as its fifth warfighting domain along with air, sea, space, and land. 
This means the military expects to conduct military operations in and through cyberspace. Note how the graphic shows the cyber domain spanning the other physical domains. As we noted previously, cyberspace cuts across and interacts with all of the other warfighting domains. Cyberspace versus other domains. How does cyberspace compare with the other warfighting domains? General Keith Alexander noted that the focus of cyber warfare is on using cyberspace by operating within or through it to attack personnel, facilities, or equipment with the intent of degrading, neutralizing, or destroying enemy combat capability while protecting our own. It is easy to see that replacing the term cyberspace in his comments with the other physical domains gives a relatively accurate description of each of those domains as well. There is still strong resistance in the military by some who state that cyberspace should not be a warfighting domain. Some have suggested it should instead be one of those six warfighting functions. However, this does not make sense. For those unfamiliar with the six joint warfighting functions, they are mission command, movement and maneuver, intelligence, fires, sustainment, and protection. These are unique functions that are executed in the warfighting domains. One cannot execute one function within or through another. One could not, for example, conduct mission command through fires. You can, however, conduct mission command through cyberspace. In fact, you can conduct elements of all the warfighting functions in and through cyberspace. Thus, logic dictates the military was correct in designating cyberspace as a warfighting domain. Cyber conflict. Cyber conflict refers to the use of computational technologies for malevolent and destructive purposes in order to impact, change, or modify diplomatic and military interactions between states. As we noted earlier, cyber conflict is an umbrella term which can encompass cyber war, cyber warfare, cyber espionage, and cyber terrorism. Generally speaking, patriotic hacking, hacktivism, and cyber crime do not fall under the banner of cyber conflict, but there are exceptions to this rule. Sometimes states will use patriotic hackers or cyber criminals as proxy actors to carry out operations. In these limited cases, these actions would also fall into the realm of cyber conflict. Cyber conflict remains in the realm of conflict, a disagreement on preferred outcomes between entities, usually nation states in this case. It is an aggressive foreign policy tactic used by states against other states. Although cyber conflict may involve both states and non-state actors, such as organizations or even individuals. For example, the gesture is an online hacktivist and vigilante who targets violent extremist Muslim organizations. His actions could certainly be considered to fall within the realm of conflict. Cyber war. Before we can define the concept of cyber war, we must define war in its modern sense. As noted earlier, to really understand the concept of cyber war, we need to simplify this concept and remove the prefix cyber. Then we must determine what actually constitutes war, and then look to the cyberspace domain and determine what actions meet this definition and what do not. War. There are a number of ways we can define war in the modern sense. Schmidt in 2002 defined war as sustained intergroup violence that usually results in the deliberate infliction of death and injury on the opposing side. The Correlates of War Project in 2001 defined war as a military conflict waged between or among national entities, at least one of which is a state, which results in at least 1,000 battle deaths of military personnel. In this latter case, this seems highly specific, and it seems unlikely that we would define war based on an exact number of people dying. It's hard to say that if 999 people die, it's not a war, but 1,000 die and it is a war. What we can say is that war involves the use of force. Anything short of this is just conflict and violence in its basic sense. Cyber war. A number of studies have attempted to define cyber war in recent years. Clark and Nake in 2010 defined cyber war as actions by nation states to penetrate another nation's computers or networks for the purpose of causing damage or disruption. This definition would not seem to be accurate enough for our purposes, as you could certainly penetrate another nation's computers or networks and cause disruption without actually calling to war. Nye defined cyber war in 2010 as hostile actions in cyberspace 
that have effects that amplify or are equivalent to major kinetic violence. While this definition is still a little too general, it has important points. It implies that actions that would constitute war in cyberspace would have to have effects similar to those in the physical domains. Lindsay defines cyber war as employing computer network attacks as a use of force to disrupt an opponent's physical infrastructure for political gain. This definition has two important points. One is the use of force, a technical term used in international law that defines violence in an international context. The other point is that such violence is used for political gains. As Clausewitz notes, war is a continuation of politics by other means. It is an act of violence intended to compel our opponents to fulfill our will. For this course, we will define cyber war as the use of computational technologies as an extension of politics to impose one state's will on another state through the infliction of violence. In trying to determine if an action falls into the spectrum of cyber war, there are three key questions to ask. First, are multiple states involved? War is a condition that exists between nation states. Does the action constitute a use of force under international law? If it does not, then it is probably violence or conflict short of war. Does the action involve infliction of violence for political gain? As we noted earlier, war is a continuum of politics by other means. As you continue with the course, ask yourself, have we actually seen cyber war? Cyber warfare. Many times people use the term cyber war and cyber warfare synonymously. This is incorrect. As noted earlier, war is a political state that exists between nation states. Billow and Chang define cyber warfare as involving units organized along nation state boundaries in offensive and defensive operations, using computers to infiltrate other computers or networks through electronic means. This is a good starting definition, but needs a little more depth. Cyber warfare can include actions short of war and short of the use of force. Cyber warfare is really a doctrinal methodology for the conduct of operations in cyberspace. Cyber warfare is the methodology of conducting operations and war within cyberspace. Cyber terrorism. As we did with cyber war, we must remove the term cyber and first define terrorism to understand the concept of cyber terrorism. Terrorism is the premeditated use or threat of use of violence by individuals to obtain a political, social, or ideological objective through the intimidation of a large audience. Given this, cyber terrorism is the use of computational technologies intended to disrupt and wreak havoc and fear in a targeted online population in order to obtain a political, social, or ideological objective. Have we seen true acts of cyber terrorism? I would say no, but that's my personal opinion. Thus far, terrorist groups have mostly used information technology for propaganda, messaging, and recruiting. There are no known public examples of direct cyber terrorist attacks that I'm aware of, although the potential for such attacks does exist. Cyber espionage. Cyber espionage can be defined as the use of computational technology to gain critical information to give a state or non-state actor a strategic advantage over a competitor or adversary. I would note that the great deal of malicious cyber activity we have seen to date is actually cyber espionage. Espionage is not illegal under international law, although every nation state probably has domestic laws that criminalize this type of activity, whether it is committed in person or via computer. Espionage is actually considered a normal interaction between nation states, and as it is an activity that falls below the level of a use of force, it is not considered problematic by the governing bodies of the international community. It should thus not be considered an attack in an international context. Cyber crime. Cyber crime is the use of information systems to conduct illegal activities for personal or financial gain. It is generally not considered to be cyber conflict. It does, however, use many of the same tools and technologies.
the importance of intent. Cyber war, espionage, terrorism, hacktivism, and crime all use roughly the same technologies. Most use the same methodologies. A tool can be used to break into a system, and it is the motivation of the actor using that tool that determines many times what that action actually constitutes. The major difference between these activities is often scale and intent. Cyber power. The ability to control or apply typical forms of control and domination we see in the physical domains to cyberspace. Cyber power depends on resources that characterize the domain of cyberspace. It is cheaper to acquire than military hardware, and this may enable small states to play on the same field as larger states in the domain of cyber conflict. Cyber attack. Cyber attack is probably the most overused term when it comes to cyber conflict and cybersecurity. It is a term which has come to mean virtually any malicious activity that takes place in cyberspace. It is used inaccurately by the press, politicians, and the general public. For this course, we will only use this term to describe an action in cyberspace which causes damage or disruption or which rises to the level of a use of force under international law. Anything else should use one of the terms in the remaining slides. Cyber incident. A cyber incident can be described as isolated operations launched against states with specific purposes and that last a matter of hours, days, or weeks. Cyber incidents usually consist of a specific target or infrastructure and are usually part of an overarching cyber dispute. Dispute. Disputes are larger campaigns in cyberspace launched against states that can contain one or several incidents. Disputes have a higher purpose and a goal for the initiating state. These can last from a day to months or even years. Cyber disputes, if prolonged, have the ability to escalate tensions among rival states. Malicious cyber activity. Malicious cyber activity is a new term defined by the Obama administration in Presidential Policy Directive 20 on cyberspace operations. Malicious cyber activity constitutes activities other than those authorized by or in accordance with US law that seek to compromise or impair the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of computers, information or communication systems, networks, physical or virtual infrastructure controlled by computers or information systems, or information resident thereon. This is really a more accurate term to use than cyber attack to describe the vast majority of malicious activity we see in cyberspace. If it's not intending to disrupt or damage systems, then it's probably not a cyber attack and should be called malicious cyber activity. State versus non-state actors. State actors are those individuals, groups, or organizations who act directly under the authority of their respective governments, whether they do so in an overt, covert, or clandestine manner. The bottom line is these actors are acting under orders from their governments, whether that is publicly attributable or not. Non-state actors are individuals, groups, organizations, or even private corporations who engage in cyber conflict activities in cyberspace without the direct authority of their respective governments. Examples of state actors include intelligence organizations such as the CIA, NSA, or MI5, military organizations such as US Cyber Command, GCHQ, and law enforcement organizations such as Department of Homeland Security or the FBI. Non-state actors can include hackers, individuals such as the gesture, groups such as anonymous or lulsec, terrorists, corporations, and even cyber militias. State-sponsored activity. To date, almost all state-sponsored activity has fallen into the realm of espionage, with a couple of limited exceptions. There have been sub-distributed denial-of-service attacks that are suspected to have been sponsored by states, such as the attacks on Estonia and Georgia. Unfortunately, this is difficult to prove, and there is no smoking gun.
Major states suspected of sponsoring or conducting cyber espionage or cyber attacks include China, Iran, Israel, North Korea, Russia, and the United States. Examples of state-sponsored incidents. Over the last 15 years, there have been numerous cases of suspected state-sponsored cyber incidents and malicious cyber activity. Some of the most notable examples are displayed on this timeline. Recent examples include the cyber attack on Sony and the OPM data breach. While the evidence for most of these incidents is not conclusive, the preponderance of the evidence for these incidents points to the involvement of state actors. Course methodologies. Throughout the remainder of this course, we will focus on three methodologies to examine cyber conflict activities and events. There are many other methodologies that researchers and operators can use to investigate such events. The three presented here are merely good and useful subset of these models. First, we will rely on evidence-based reasoning as our main methodology for examining events. We will form hypotheses and rely on credible evidence, critical thinking, and analysis to prove or refute our positions. With this as the underlying methodology, we will use two other perspectives to examine events. We will attempt to look at cyber conflict events from an international relations perspective, focusing on the concepts of restraint, regionalism, and emerging norms in the international community. Second, we will use historical analysis to look at current events through the focusing lens of history. Evidence-based reasoning. As discussed in lesson one, we will use evidence-based reasoning to examine cyber conflict events. We will develop hypotheses, gather scholarly, authoritative, and empirical evidence to support or refute our probable conclusions, and follow the preponderance of evidence to the most likely conclusions. Avoid rhetoric, unsupported opinions, and hype. International Relations Perspective Using evidence-based reasoning as our underlying methodology, we will examine methods, motives, and the impact of each incident from an international relations perspective. We will use structured and focused case studies and international data sets to illuminate trends over time and to forecast the types of events we can expect to see in the future. Examples of case study questions under international perspective include, how did the cyber incident come about? What was the foreign policy and international relations context of the action? What was the impact of the incident on the target? What was the target's reaction to the incident? Historical analysis perspective. Another methodology we'll explore is a historical analysis perspective. The old saying goes that anyone who does not know their history is doomed to repeat it. This is certainly happening today in the cyber conflict domain. We will attempt to remedy that by studying past incidents and applying the lessons learned from those incidents to events occurring today. One such methodology we can employ is battlefield analysis. This methodology is used by the U.S. Army to study past battles. In battlefield analysis methodology, we identify events, describe the historical context surrounding those events, describe the incident, determine the outcomes of that incident. In other words, was it a tactical success or failure, or was it a strategic success and failure? Sometimes one doesn't lead to the other. Just because you have tactical success does not always mean that translates to strategic success. And finally, we will try to assess the significance of the incident in the context of history. Flambe case study. For our first case study, we will use the battlefield analysis methodology to look at an incident from 2012 that has been called Flambe. The Flambe incident was an intrusion used to commit data theft. It was most likely an example of state-sponsored cyber espionage. According to L'Express magazine, in May of 2012, computers of the offices of the former French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, were compromised by a variant of the Flame malware. This incident took place during the 2012 French presidential elections. The actors involved in this incident were France and an unknown state actor. Some French policymakers have claimed this intrusion was carried out by the United States, but there is no clear motive or evidence to suggest this was actually the case. During the Flambe incident, French policymakers were duped into accepting friend requests on Facebook from false accounts. 
the victims were then sent links to a fake Elise webpage where they entered their real login and password details. The attacker was then able to harvest these credentials and use them to log into the real Elise network. The attacker also used corrupted Word and PDF files to install the Flambe malware onto the victim's computers. These compromises allowed the malicious actor to gain access to the LSA network and exfiltrate data. At the tactical level, this incident was obviously a success. The attacker was able to compromise the LSA network and exfiltrate sensitive data. At the strategic level, the results are unknown since we do not know the greater context of this incident the strategic motives of the attacker, or how the attacker was able to use the stolen information. The incident appears to have relatively low significance. The French press attributed the intrusion to the United States, but largely wrote it off as normal espionage activities that take place between states, even when those states are allies. The United States has denied involvement, and there's little motive or evidence on their part to suggest that the U.S. was involved, other than the fact that the Flambe malware was a variant of the flame worm, which many attribute to the United States. So what lessons can we take away from the Flambe case study? First and foremost is that there is a significant danger that malware, once used, can be re-engineered by others and reused for new purposes. Each time a sophisticated piece of malware is revealed, we inevitably see new versions of this malware produced by multiple other states and non-state actors. This is an important consideration when debating the use of such tools. Second. Successful cyber attacks and intrusions often hinge on the failures of the target to adequately protect their systems. In the case of Flambe, the sensitive data was on networks connected directly to the internet. There was no air gapping. Additionally, the victims, in this case French politicians and policymakers, were very susceptible to social engineering and spear phishing. Overall, this incident could have easily been prevented through some basic cyber hygiene and some basic security training. As you will see in upcoming lessons, this is a reoccurring problem in the cyber conflict domain. Conclusion. The cyber conflict domain is largely defined by extreme rhetoric, hyperbole, and inaccuracy. In this course, we define and agree on common terminology so that we can be specific in the language we use to describe incidents in this domain. We will use structured analysis methods which rely on strong, credible, relevant, and accurate evidence when analyzing cyber incidents. We will use these tools to cut through the hype to get to a real understanding of cyber conflict as it exists today. Keep all of these concepts and tools in mind as you continue your exploration of the cyber conflict domain in the coming weeks. I hope you enjoyed this introductory week of the course, and I look forward to working with each of you to expand your knowledge of the concepts covered throughout the rest of the course. References. A quick note on references. As you can see in this slide, I have tried to detail all the references I've used throughout the production of this presentation. This slide and the one that follows it should serve as a model for your references slide when you build your presentation at the end of the course.